Happy Friday, Monsters. We are so glad that you could join us for today's episode. These weekly podcast episodes also serve as weekly meetings for our very own true crime cults. That's right. We started a cult so that all of our spooky friends have somewhere to go for non-stop creepy content. But never fear, you've landed in the call with all of the adorable baby goats and none of the brainwashing. In case you're just joining us for the very first time today, allow us to introduce ourselves. I'm Angelina, and I'm here with my bewitching bestie, Aurora. How was your week? Uh, it's great. You know, just uh, looking forward to Halloween. How about you? Um, similar. I need to, like, go shopping for my last... Um, uh, Halloween costume details, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. which I think will be really easy to find. Um, I don't know if I, well, I don't know if I should even announce what I'm being or just <laughs> surprise, but like, yeah, it's going to be an easy one to put together, but for, um, a good effect. <laughs> if you want to see it, you will have to join us on Patreon. Yes, you will. <laughs> Patreon and or uh, come to book club because we're going to be in costume oh, yeah. for book that. Book club so. too. Oh, yeah, real easy. Mm-hmm. And that one is free. Mm-hmm. And also I'm sure we'll be posting these pictures on social media after too. Oh yeah, <laughs> we will definitely do that. <laughs> It's fun to imagine yourself as an honorary cult member as you listen to our show, but if you'd like to make it official, you can join the MMN Commune on Patreon. You'll find us at patreon.com slash murder murder news. To show how much we appreciate your monthly pledge, we'll give you a shout out on the show, your own official title like Grandmaster of Goats, and we'll even send you your very own adorable baby goat. Our Halloween special episode comes out on Patreon on the 31st. So if you're a patron, make sure you keep an eye out for that. Now let's kick things off with some of the true crime stories that made headlines this week. Following a high-speed chase and a four-hour police standoff, authorities have confirmed that a couple under investigation for their involvement in multiple murders have been found deceased in a desert area southeast of Kingman, Nevada. 26-year-old... Hunter McGuire and 32-year-old Samantha Brennick were wanted in connection to a double homicide that took place in Kingman in June, as well as the fatal shooting of a woman last Monday in Las Vegas. Additional murders possibly linked to McGuire are still under active investigation. The couple were found laying side by side last Friday, both with gunshot wounds to the head. Lake Havasalp City Police believe McGuire's gunshot wound to be self-inflicted, but it's unclear who shot Brannock. The county medical examiner will soon confirm an official cause of death. There's been an update to the murder case of 69-year-old Vita Smith, who was last seen in July of 2020. For 30 years, Smith traveled all over the world playing blackjack and counting cards with partner Chris Lee, also known as Kevin Barton. Lee, a 62-year-old Calgary man, is currently on trial for the murder of Smith, whose body has never been found. Surveillance footage revealed in court shows Chris Lee parked at a car wash where he washed and vacuumed his car, disposed of a homemade gun silencer, and tossed a set of car keys belonging to Vita Smith into the bushes. The pair, who Prosecutor Shane Parker describes as frenemies, had been experiencing some financial strife around the time of the murder— due to pandemic-related casino closures. It's unclear whether the jury will hear Lee testify in his own defense, but an offer to plead guilty to manslaughter has already been rejected. We'll be back after a quick commercial break. Good evening, creeps. You know, everybody's entitled to one good scare on Halloween. I told you, you need to go check on the children. But the podcasts of the Dark Cast Network have enough scares to fill even the largest trick-or-treat sack. No razor blades, I promise. Join the pods of the Dark Cast Network, including Murder, Murder News, Sinister Story Hour, Beyond the Rainbow, Cause of Death, October Pod AM, Rogue Darkness, Over the Fence, and me, Brenda, host of Horrifying History, for a pajama jammy jam of deliciously dark, devilish, and disturbing Halloween treats. There was always something eerie about the second floor of this house. We are like the house handing out full-size Snicker bars for your ears. And we're coming to this podcast, yes, the one you're listening to right now, on October 31st. That's Halloween Day 2022 on your favorite podcast streaming apps. A long time ago, a man murdered his wife in that room. 
Don't forget to wear your coziest pajamas for the DarkCast Network Halloween Sleepover, coming to this podcast on Halloween Day. (laughs) And we're back. Before we dig in, we want to offer a quick disclaimer. Though we joke about forming a true crime cult, that is not to diminish the severity of actual cult activity. And we want you to know that we take the cases we're discussing very seriously. We want to deliver each story with the utmost respect to victims and anyone involved. If you feel we've missed the mark, you don't like our tone, or if you notice we've gotten any details wrong, let us know with a quick email to murdermurdernews at gmail.com and we'll make it right. Some specific trigger warnings for this episode include domestic violence and child murder. If any of those are particularly sensitive subjects for you, feel free to skip this one and listen to one of our other episodes instead. When we discussed the mysterious death of Misty Upham, we pointed out that being a celebrity does not necessarily earn a person any extra attention from the police, even in the event of a disappearance that may well actually be a murder. In today's story, we'll explore a number of other ways that fame can impact a criminal case. Are celebrities and their families more vulnerable to crimes like stalking, harassment, and violent attacks brought on by feelings of jealousy? Do wealth and fame provide any safeguards against falling under the spell of a manipulative menace? Can money really buy a higher level of security? Should a celebrity be allowed to provide witness testimony or a victim impact statement, or might that sway the jury in their favor? Unless you're a big fan of Jennifer Hudson, you may not be aware of the tragedy that tore through her family 14 years ago this week, just as the singer and actress was shooting to superstardom. Listen on and we'll fill you in on what went down, how J. Hud's celebrity status affected the case, and how the case affected the trajectory of her career. Sources for today's episode include the Disgraceland podcast, who undoubtedly did a much more entertaining version of this story than we're about to do. So when you're done here, you should go listen to Disgraceland, if nothing else, just for the background music and sound effects. The podcast is about the intersection of the music industry and true crime, which is actually pretty fascinating, and I'll probably revisit the podcast to hear more of their episodes. Uh, Other sources include the Fruit Loops podcast, which is always amazing. If you tune into our show often, you know how much we love them. Also, Biography.com, The Irish Times, Distractify, and more. For a full list of sources, be sure to check out today's episode description. Jennifer Kate Hudson was born in Chicago, Illinois on September 12, 1981. She grew up the youngest of three siblings with an older brother, Jason, and older sister, Julia. The Hudson children were largely raised by a single mother, Darnell Donerson. Darnell had grown up Darnell Hudson, and her children used her maiden name for their family name. The family was quite religious. Jennifer came from a long line of Baptists. The family lived and went to church in the Inglewood neighborhood of Chicago. Disgraceland repeatedly described Inglewood as the most dangerous four square miles in the city. It's also the most poverty-stricken four square miles of the city. As Disgraceland pointed out, a large part of the reason why the Hudson family was so close-knit and leaned so heavily on the religious faith is probably because they were brought up in such a rough neighborhood. Hudson calls the Windy City home to this day, telling the Irish Times, quote, I always say living in Chicago allows my feet to touch the ground. I travel for my work, but this is home. Jennifer's love of music was born in Pleasant Gift Missionary Baptist Church, which her family attended. She started out singing in the church choir at the age of seven, with a nudge from her maternal grandmother, Julia, who Jennifer's older sister was named after. Speaking of Julia, Jennifer told the Irish Times, quote, My grandmother led a hundred solos in the church choir. She could have been famous, but chose not to, because she only wanted to sing for the Lord. Jennifer took a different path. At 11, she sang at her great-grandmother's 90th birthday party, and party patrons were awestruck. After being recognized for her beautiful singing voice at a young age, Jennifer Hudson decided to embark on a career in music. She wanted to be just like her vocal idols, Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, Patti LaBelle, and Mariah Carey. At several points along her rise to fame, Hudson has asserted, I do what I do because I love it. Aside from music, Jennifer was also very passionate about family. 
As a young teen, she grew curious about her birth father and whether she might have siblings left to meet. Hudson told Atlanta Black Star, quote, it was always my dream because I loved family to have a giant table with all my siblings. At 15 years old, Jennifer enlisted the help of her sister, Julia, and set out to find her father, all with her mother's blessing. The children were shocked to find that their dad, Samuel Simpson, fathered a total of 27 children, 11 girls and 16 boys. Having met some, but not all of her siblings, Jennifer's life was enriched by the realization that she was actually part of a very large family. Finding Samuel, who went by Sam, couldn't have gone better. He even moved in with the family in Inglewood. A professional bus driver for Greyhound, he promised Jennifer that he would be the one to drive her off to college when the time came. Unfortunately, Sam couldn't deliver on that promise as he passed away the following year when Jennifer was 16. Still, the family was so grateful that they had the chance to reconnect while Sam was still living. Jennifer graduated from Dunbar Vocational Academy in 1999 and enrolled at Langston University, the only historically black college in Oklahoma. Homesick and equally sick of the weather in Langston, Hudson dropped out after just one semester. She later registered at Kennedy King College, a community college in Chicago, to study music. Jennifer's first major gig was aboard Disney Cruise Line's Disney Wonder, where she performed as Calliope, the head muse in Hercules the Musical. Ed Whitlow, a longtime Disney cast member and mentor for Jennifer, has described her as amazingly talented and a truly gifted singer, which explains how she was able to land her first recording contract in 2002 with Righteous Records, an indie label based in Chicago. Whitlow encouraged the young performer to branch out, telling her, quote, if you want to advance your career, you have to get on television. She set her sights on American Idol. The day she got off the Disney Wonder, at the end of her contract in 2004, Jennifer drove straight to Atlanta to audition for the show, which was scouting for its third season on Fox. Righteous Records released her from a five-year recording contract so that she would be free to appear on TV. Judge Randy Jackson warned, we are expecting more than a cruise ship performance from you. And Hudson certainly delivered, belting out a soulful rendition of Elton John's Circle of Life. She certainly did exceed expectations. (laughs) She was so great in that (laughs) season. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Jennifer Hudson made it to the top seven, but was eliminated after performing Barry Manilow's Weekend in New England. This was such a controversial move, with many arguing that Hudson could outsing any other contestants and that she never should have been ousted. However, It may have been a blessing in disguise because as we reflect back on the show's prior contestants, many runners up went on to achieve lasting fame, whereas many of the series winners soon faded into obscurity. In May of 2010, the LA Times called Hudson the third greatest idol contestant of all time behind Kelly Clarkston and Carrie Underwood. She's just so talented. She was great on that show. She definitely was cheated. Oh, yeah. Additionally, we weren't aware of this, but Disgraceland pointed out that the night that Jennifer Hudson was sent home from American Idol, a tornado hit Chicago. Any of you who watched American Idol know that the winner of each round is determined by way of called-in votes. Obviously, in the midst of a natural disaster, not many Chicagoans called in that day to vote for their hometown girl, Jay Hud, which most definitely contributed to her elimination. Jennifer's next big break was when she was cast in the 2006 film Dreamgirls alongside Beyonce and Eddie Murphy. Biography.com has described her rendition of, and I am telling you, I'm not going as rapturous. Entertainment Weekly called it a soul to the rafters performance. Newsweek's Dreamgirls review announced that when moviegoers hear Hudson sing, she is going to raise goosebumps across the land, and that she certainly did. Her performance ultimately earned her a total of 29 awards, including a Golden Globe and an Oscar. We just want to stress how exceptional it is that Hudson received awards, let alone an Oscar, for her first ever role in a movie. In 2006, the singer signed a deal with Arista Records and got to work on her first full-length solo album. As recording wrapped in 2008, it was already shaping up to be Jennifer Hudson's year. Everything she had strived for her entire life was coming together. 
In May 2008, she played Carrie Bradshaw's tech-savvy assistant, Louise, in the Sex and the City movie. In June 2008, her single Spotlight dropped, and Hudson had her first top 40 hit, with the song peaking at number 24. In August, Jennifer was asked to perform at the Democratic National Convention, where she sang both the national anthem and A Change is Going to Come. In September, her debut album was released, earning her a Grammy for Best R&B Album. That same month, she got engaged to her boyfriend, David Otunga, a graduate of Harvard Law, an actor, and professional wrestler with the WWE. In October, the film The Secret Life of Bees came out, featuring Jennifer Hudson as Rosaline, the mother figure to Dakota Fanning's character, Lily. Hudson played alongside Queen Latifah, Alicia Keys, and Sophie Okonedo. The film won two People's Choice Awards. While Jennifer was busy catapulting to the top, some dark family drama simmered on the back burner. Fame unfortunately can't save you from tragedy. None of us are immune. On the contrary, living life in the spotlight might make it harder to be open about navigating personal and family issues. We've talked a lot about the red flags that can crop up when dealing with a toxic personality, and that no matter how obvious they may seem in retrospect, self-talk seems to shut down all the signs in the moment. You think, maybe I'm making a big deal out of nothing, or maybe I'm being too sensitive. You wouldn't want to ruin someone's reputation over a gut feeling. When you're already in the tabloids, you want to avoid jumping to any conclusions that would fuel the paparazzi. As such, Jennifer and her family silently suffered through their relationship with Mr. William Balfour. Julia Hudson, Jennifer's older sister, met William Balfour when they were all students at Yale Elementary School. William was four years younger than Julia, the same age as Jennifer, and he and Jennifer were actually in the same class in sixth grade. At that point in time, William lived just a few blocks away from the Hudson family home on South Yale Avenue. Jennifer has stated she never liked him, not in sixth grade and not later. Quote, I tried to keep my distance with William any chance I got, she has said. Where he was, I tried not to be. Balfour was not a good guy. As much as the Hudson kids were born into love and faith, William Balfour was born into crime. His grandmother served time in prison for manslaughter. His father was a convicted murderer. His parents were violently abusive, and William weaved in and out of the foster care system growing up. Even as a little kid, he hung around the wrong crowd. At just 14, William was charged with heroin possession and was sentenced to spend some time in a juvenile detention center. When he got out, he joined the Gangster Disciples, one of Chicago's most prominent gangs. He started selling crack pretty soon after that. At 17, Balfour hijacked a car and took its owner for a wild ride through the city streets as he clinged onto the roof rack. He drove into a telephone pole, then fled the scene, but was ultimately convicted of attempted murder, vehicular hijacking, and possession of a stolen vehicle, and sentenced to seven years in jail. However, as can happen to the best of us, Julia Hudson fell for the bad boy. Quote, none of us wanted her to marry him, Jennifer has said of Balfour. I would tell her over and over again not to marry William. But in late 2006, Julia did just that. Jennifer did not understand the attraction, but what's more, she scrambled to use everything she had to convince her older sister to stay away from William. What did he have that Julia wanted? The Hudson family gave her plenty of love. Could it be about money? Jennifer offered to buy her sister a house, take her on fancy vacations, whatever she wanted, as long as she kicked that creep to the curb. But Julia wouldn't be swayed. Julia Hudson and William Balfour privately eloped, presumably because they were well aware that no one supported their union. No one even knew they were married until months after the fact. Julia lived at home with her mom at the house on South Yale Avenue where she grew up. So did Julia and Jennifer's brother, Jason Hudson. Julia's young son from a previous relationship also lived there. And when William came into her life, he moved in too. If Jennifer Hudson wasn't well on her way to being a famous singer and actress, she likely would have been living there as well. However, the family was lacking financially. They had a surplus of love and faith and nothing fed their souls more than spending time together and going to church all together as a family. It just made sense to live together. 
Though no one besides Julia was particularly fond of William, welcoming him into the family home just felt like the Christian thing to do. Balfour made enough of an effort to be a good parent to little Julian to impress Julia, even writing proud parent on his MySpace profile. But he clearly didn't have any genuine love for the child or for his mother. He was manipulative, jealous, possessive, and now that he lived at the Hudson family home, everyone else could see it. He would act jealous and get snappy at Julia just for spending time alone with her relatives or showing any affection to anyone but him. Julia's old co-workers have recalled William coming into her workplace to give her shit, humiliating her, all because he imagined that she might have struck up an affair with a male co-worker. Because Julia dared to work in a space where men also existed, she got an earful. At home, when little Julian would hug and kiss his mom, William would often sneer, get off my wife. Maria Wilkes, a young teenager from the neighborhood, recalled running into William Balfour in a park in Inglewood during the summer of 2008. He was talking to me about his wife and how she was cheating on him, Maria says. He was just saying how she got a new boyfriend and how he didn't want to leave her. He said he was going to have to deal with it. Later that summer, Maria was walking down South Yale Avenue and overheard an argument between William and Julia. I heard him tell her that if she was going to call the police, he would kill her and her family. Less than two years after their wedding, Julia and William separated. From what we could glean from our sources, it looks like Julia took a gradual approach, taking baby steps to separate herself from her husband. William moved out and decided he could date other people because he had assumed Julia was already seeing other people anyway. Living apart, he could no longer keep an eye on her, so he figured there was no limit to what she could get up to. The two still hung out from time to time and still had a sexual relationship, but as far as her family knew, Julia was estranged from William Balfour. As Balfour saw it, Julia still belonged to him. We have spoken several times about how leaving can be the most dangerous time in the life of a victim of domestic violence. The fact that Julia kept seeing William and couldn't push him completely out of her life might sound like she was being reckless, but it might have been the only way Julia felt she could safely put any distance between herself and her husband. And getting him to move out may have been her best effort at keeping him away from her family if she couldn't save herself. On October 24th, 2008, Julia Hudson's day got off to a scary start. While peeking through her window, William Balfour spotted some heart-shaped balloons attached to a gift for Julia, which he assumed must be from her new beau. As soon as she stepped out of the house, he was there to confront her to criticize her for daring to allow another man into her life and to threaten her and her family once more. Julia told William to buzz off and headed off to work as a school bus driver. When she returned home that afternoon, Julia was greeted by a bullet hole in the front door of the Hudson home. Deep down, she already knew what she could expect to find inside, but she wasn't ready to face it. Julia called on a neighbor to go inside ahead of her and report back. The neighbor confirmed Julia's horrifying hunch. Inside, her 57-year-old mother Darnell's motionless body lay face down on the living room carpet, in a pool of her own blood. She wore a white nightgown, which was now heavily bloodstained. Multiple bullet wounds ran up the length of her spine. Beyond resuscitation, Darnell's body had gone cold. Upstairs and down the hall, Jason's bedroom door hung open to reveal the 29-year-old man's face frozen in a peaceful expression, peeking out from the bedspread tucked around him. He looked just like he was sleeping, save for the gunshot wounds bleeding into the blankets. Julia was afraid to ask about her son, Julian. The neighbor said she didn't see the child anywhere. The two went into the home together to check the boy's bedroom, to call out to him, and to check any spots in the house where he could be hiding. A wave of relief swept over Julia. She could still hold on to hope that her son was alive. Julia called 911 and an Amber Alert was issued for seven-year-old Julian King, which mentioned that Jason's white suburban SUV was also missing from the scene. Jennifer Hudson offered a substantial award for the return of her nephew, but no ransom was ever called in. While Julia stood outside the home on South Yale Avenue with a group of police officers called to the crime scene, her cell phone rang. On the other end was no other than William Balfour. 
He told his wife that he had heard about her family from some folks around the neighborhood. That was pretty unlikely because no one was talking about it yet. It was still in the very first phases of the investigation, and there hadn't been any official press release. William told Julia that he was up north, but would come down to see her as soon as he could. Jennifer Hudson knew something was wrong before anyone even had a chance to call her. She called or texted with her mom every single day, and when she hadn't heard from Darnell at all on October 24th, she got a bad feeling. She was hanging out in Florida at the time with her fiancé, David Otunga. David had a wrestling gig in the Sunshine State, and Jennifer thought she might as well tag along and get away from the cold weather that had already started creeping into Chicago. When Julia called, Jennifer was on the next plane back home. She imagined that if she hadn't decided to go to Florida with David, she would probably be dead too. William Balfour was the first and only suspect, based on the few bits of information police had up front. Julia had an estranged husband. The guy was a career criminal. He had specifically threatened to kill his wife's family. He made that suspicious phone call to Julia while she stood with police at the crime scene. And where was he now? Up north, he had said. Investigators canvassed Englewood, speaking to friends and neighbors of the Hudson family and Mr. Balfour. Some reported hearing gunshots that morning, but didn't call the police, because in that area, hearing gunshots was a pretty regular occurrence. Neighbors said they had seen William stalking Julia and heard him utter threats to murder her entire family. Authorities located Balfour using cell phone tower triangulation and found him to be hiding out at the home of his new girlfriend, Shanta Cathy, on the west side of the city. She told police that her boyfriend had been with her all day since early that morning. William Balfour was taken into police custody and locked in an interrogation room. At the time, he was still on parole from his last stint in prison, and so he was held at Stateville Correctional Center on charges of parole violation which was great because they didn't yet have enough evidence to charge him with the murders, but didn't feel great about releasing him either. There was still a chance they could find Julian and save him from suffering a similar fate to his uncle and grandmother. Balfour vehemently denied having any involvement whatsoever. He suggested the murders could have been related to Jason being a crack dealer. He said with crack addicts coming by the house day in and day out, anything was possible. Friends say Jason hadn't let anyone come by the house in some time, neither clients nor friends. All of that stopped after a robbery wherein Julia's house keys and Jason's 45 caliber gun were stolen. Three days later, a woman named Lynette Williams called in a sighting of the stolen SUV. She said she first noticed the vehicle parked in a lot on Chicago's west side on the morning of the 25th, but didn't think anything of it until she saw the Amber Alert. Responding officers opened the door to the SUV and looked in the back seat. On the floor, underneath a shower curtain, was a decomposing body of Julian King. He had been shot execution style and died from a bullet wound to the brain. The vehicle was abandoned just over a mile away from Shanta Cathy's apartment. Investigators explored the area surrounding the spot where the SUV was parked and found a 45 caliber handgun among the weeds growing in a vacant lot. The gun was confirmed to have been the weapon used in all three murders. Fingerprints pulled from the inside of the vehicle and the handle of the gun were not a match for William Balfour. Of course, that doesn't mean he didn't do it. He could have been wearing gloves, but it doesn't give the police much evidence to work with. Ultimately, authorities say Balfour's phone records are what sealed the deal. Contrary to the alibi provided by Shanta Cathy, The phone records placed William in the area of the Hudson family home at the time of the murders of Darnell Donerson and Jason Hudson. The case went to trial in 2012, after four years had passed since the murders. The defense team tried to evoke a state law that considered conversations between spouses to be confidential, in hopes that they could bar Julia Hudson from describing the death threats issued by her husband. Problem is, he didn't just threaten Julia to her face. William would spout off to anyone who would listen about his troubles with his wife and how he might just kill her entire family. Several had overheard him threatening his wife directly. I'll kill your whole family, Balfour had said. I'll kill you last. You'll have to watch me kill them all first, and then I'll kill you too. 
Shanta Cathy retracted the alibi she had originally provided and admitted that not only had William not been at her house all day, but when he did show up that afternoon, he admitted to killing Darnell and Jason. She said she'd seen him with a 45 caliber gun that day. Other witnesses spoke about Balfour bragging about stealing Jason Hudson's gun in the months before the murders. Several friends of Balfour testified that he had phoned them on the day of the murders, asking them to pull some sketchy job involving moving his car around the city or to provide a false alibi for him. Brittany Acoff Howard, William's ex-girlfriend, said that he asked her to claim he had been helping her shop for dresses that day, but she refused. Investigators revealed that while exploring Balfour's alibi, they found he lied about taking a bus to Kathy's house as his bus pass had not been used. He didn't take the train that day either. They scoured security footage, and he wasn't anywhere on public transit that day. The prosecution pointed out the gunshot residue that was found on William Balfour's clothes and the keys that were found in his pocket the day he was arrested at Shanta Cathy's apartment, which were found to belong to Jason Hudson's stolen SUV. A jury found William Balfour guilty of three counts of first-degree murder, as well as home invasion, aggravated kidnapping, residential burglary, and possession of a stolen motor vehicle. A jury that had been heavily vetted, ensuring that there were no Jennifer Hudson fans in the lot. A judge had also cautioned jury members to avoid watching American Idol. Illinois law dictates that an automatic sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole be issued to any person who is convicted of more than one murder, which meant that Jennifer and Julie Hudson didn't have to provide victim impact statements and could grieve privately. A statement was, however, provided by Julian's father, Gregory King. Quote, I miss picking Julian up from the school bus. I miss going on field trips with him. I miss him spending the night with me and my other children. I miss him bugging me about SpongeBob SquarePants, a cartoon character he was kind of afraid of. I miss spending time with my son, Julian. William Balfour forever took my chance to make new memories with my son. William Balfour forever took my son from me. He took Julian from his siblings, Greg and Tamia. My son can't come back. But thank God that justice was served by the jury's guilty verdict. Balfour offered his deepest sympathies to the Hudson family and proclaimed his love for little Julian. Judge Charles Burns didn't buy it and called Balfour's statement an insult to all of us. He continued, your heart is an Arctic night and your soul is as barren as dark space. The amazing Jennifer Hudson didn't skip a beat. A few months after the murders, she sang the national anthem at Super Bowl 43 and then toured the U.S. with Robin Thicke. She became more engaged in activism, appearing on the Hope for Haiti telethon and performing at a fundraiser for presidential hopeful Barack Obama, who now considers her a friend. She helped out at the American Foundation for AIDS Research, the Barbara Davis Center for Childhood Diabetes, Bid to Beat AIDS, and the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. The year after the murders, Jennifer and her husband David welcomed a son, David Daniel Otunga Jr., Jennifer lost 80 pounds, became a spokesperson for Weight Watchers, and published a book titled, I Got This, How I Changed My Ways and Lost What Weighed Me Down. She started her own clothing line. She was asked by Aretha Franklin directly to play her in a biopic, and she killed it. In November of 2013, the 2,512 star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame was dedicated to Hudson. She's the youngest person to ever achieve EGOT status, meaning you have an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. She was the second Black woman to achieve the status after Whoopi Goldberg did it in 2002. On top of all her achievements, Jennifer Hudson was remarkably able to forgive William Balfour. In a televised conversation with Oprah, the incredibly empathetic Hudson declared, quote, for the most part, it's not his fault. It's like what he was taught and how he was brought up. We tried to offer love. He was so far gone, he couldn't even see that. He never had a chance. Jennifer and Julia Hudson teamed up to create the Hudson King Foundation for Families of Slain Victims, an organization dedicated to providing food, shelter, clothing, and counseling to families who have lost relatives as a result of violent crime. 
the sisters noticed how no one cares for families of murder victims, even if they're famous. No one reaches out to offer them support, and they wanted to change that. Such a great idea. I love that. Yeah. They also created the Julian D. King Gift Foundation to provide stability, support, and positive experiences for children of all backgrounds so they can grow into healthy and happy adults and provide a system of support for the children and their parents so they can create meaningful relationships with people who care. Seeing that William Balfour never had a chance, the Hudsons had to do what they could to prevent other kids in similar situations from slipping through the cracks. To me, it's just amazing um, how she is able to look at this whole thing objectively right. and just like, uh, like, obviously anyone who's gone through something like that and lost their loved ones in a violent attack, like has the right to just sit and wallow with that. Right. And like, uh, and to be angry as hell and not forgive yeah. the person and not forget like have empathy yeah, exactly. for their past and their childhood. But yeah, it's yeah. very astounding that she was able to do that. Amazing. Uh, she's. Yeah, she deserves everything she's got. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So talented. I forgot she has an EGOT. Of course she does. She's so incredible. <laughs> but man, this one like really got me. Like it's just the like, hearing that Julian was gone. I just remember thinking like, okay, well, they'll find him. You know, like the dad's not going to like shoot this or not the dad, the like husband's not going to shoot this kid. I know it's not his kid, mm -hmm. but like clearly he took him away from the scene because he wasn't able to yeah. kill him at the house. Like he right. probably, you know, like I can't even imagine killing anybody, but killing a child has to be so much harder to process with their innocence and their like cute big eyes yeah. and everything. And yeah. it's like, you think like, okay, he took him, like, it's not great for Julian, but like, at least he had enough empathy that he decided not to end his life. And then he freaking did it anyways. Yeah. Just and it, awful. it makes, it makes very little sense. I don't understand how that became like how he decided to steal a car and yeah. take Julian away from the scene and then kill him anyway. It just like, it doesn't really add up to like, yeah. obviously he doesn't follow a lot of logic anyways, no. because like but you would hope like he would have time to cool down, you know, like he's yeah. reacting in the heat of the moment and this like jealous rage he's going through, but he's taken Julian. He's given himself time to like find some logic and to find a better headspace, but he didn't get mm -hmm. there obviously. And it's just so mm -hmm. freaking sad. Julian was so cute too. Yeah. And it's like super um, disturbing also that Balfour never um, agreed that he was guilty, never confessed to any of it. And like, even in the last moment was like, I loved them. I love this kid even. It's like the judge was so accurate with the um, the statement about him being cold and his soul being barren is <laughs> like, uh, cause that's like pretty bold to say that at all. Like why say anything? Yeah. And then, you know, even all the more reason for the Hudsons to hate him. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, it's amazing that she doesn't hate him. Like, I do. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know <laughs> their too. family, but I like, hate him. <laughs> monster. Yeah. So what are you watching this week? Um, you know, I didn't have a chance to watch much. I had so much to catch up on after... Uh, being sick. <laughs> so yeah, you had a big watch week last week. So <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think the only thing I watched, I can't think of what it's called was a TV show based on abducted in plain sight. Oh, uh, I'm trying to find the name of it. Cause that's not what it's called, but it's a, um, it's a, it's called a friend of the family. Oh, and it's on Peacock, and it was made with I forget if the daughter's name's Jane or Jan, the one that was like actually abducted. I can't remember, but Jan sounds Jan more likely. Sounds more I think. likely. Yeah, um, yeah, it is Jan, and it's it was made like with her input, uh, which you know we like that, especially after the whole Dahmer yeah. mishap. Um, yeah. And the mom is played by Anna Paquin. The oh. dad is played by uh, Colin Hanks, who is Tom Hanks' son. <laughs> oh yeah, and then Tom Hanks' good son. Yeah, <laughs> he has he has another weird son apparently really? that's like a uh, QAnon guy, mm. and which QAnon believes that Tom Hanks eat, eats babies. So what the fuck? <laughs> this guy's name is like. Um, God, what is it? He's maybe Chad or something, something like that. You know, he's uh, he's terrible. <laughs> oh my gosh! But the other one, Colin Hanks, is the good one. So yeah, carry on. <laughs> yeah, and then the um, 
the guy that like actually abducted Jan, who's just the worst. Um, mm. I can't think of who he's played by, but he was in the office. He was like brought in kind of late in the office. Gosh, I can't think of his name, but he always plays like such a good bad guy. And he was like nice. the love interest of uh, maybe Aaron, like on the office that like came in later. Mm. I forget. Interesting. Um, but I think, I don't remember. Maybe they didn't date. I forget like who exactly what role he played <laughs> on The Office, but I know it's he was been in a while. it. And yeah, but he's in like lots of things and it's good. It's a really tough watch. Well, I mean, if it's anything like Abducted in Plain Sight, that was a tough watch, but also just fucking bonkers. So like you couldn't so bonkers. Not, like you're glued to the screen with it. It's just like, so I'd be interested in watching anything else about that, to be honest. So yeah. But, you know, it's interesting how, um, you know, and I think we're sort of like learning this, like some of the um, disapproval for Dahmer is it's like one thing to like describe your experience or someone else's experience. And it's another thing to like script it, to act it out and to yes. actually like make it something we have to experience and like mm -hmm. live in. And um, so when you take all the components to abducted in plain sight where he's um, sexually abusing the girl and like whatever. And then you actually have to make that a thing instead of like talking about it as a theoretical. Yeah. Um, they do a good job of like not glamorizing it and not like showing anything. Obviously we can't like, show, like, you know, yeah. like traumatize this poor child actress, yeah. like whatever, like they kind of like skirt around it and like insinuate, but it's really well done, but, uh, it is definitely a, a tough watch, but very good and engaging, especially with, you know, like those great actors too. Wow. Yeah. I'll I forgot Anna Paquin out. got an Oscar like as a child. Rick oh, did she? Me. For what? Yeah. Um, I think the piano or something. Oh, okay. Interesting. I hope I'm not wrong about that. Let me <laughs> Google it. <laughs> I'm making up names. I've never seen it. Also, I didn't know she was from New Zealand. I didn't know that either. She just has an American accent. Yeah. Well, like uh, maybe, you know, I know the... Um, the New Zealand accent is pretty similar to the Australian accent. And we were talking before yeah. about how Australians all seem to be so freaking good at American accents. Like when they're, you it's know, true. actors, you can't even tell. So it's always surprising. Maybe like Kiwis, it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, yes, she did win an Oscar as a kid. Oh, she looks so little accepting this. Let me Aww. see. <laughs> <laughs> she became the second youngest winner. Da, da, da. I was going to say, Let's how many see. kids have, like, received Oscars? Like, wow. I think that's, I don't know. It is for the, she plays Holly Hunter's daughter in The Piano, which I've never oh, seen. And she's, either. like, so tiny wow. in 1993 accepting this award as oh an 11-year-old and, like, looks very 90s in Aww. her outfit. <laughs> very cute. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's all I've watched. How about you? <laughs> Uh, well, I didn't watch anything crimey. Mm -hmm. um, I watched a horror movie called mm. uh, Saint Maud, which I had heard a bunch about. A lot of people were saying it's really good, really scary, really disturbing. I disagree. <laughs> it was good enough. I mean, it wasn't a bad movie. It had, uh, you know, nice pacing, good acting, whatever. But, like, uh, the big reveal was not such a shocking twist to me. And... Um, like most of the scenes were just not like scary. So I don't know. I, I wouldn't consider it one of those intense, like uh, super scary, disturbing movies. So um, I don't know if you, if you don't like super scary, disturbing movies, maybe it's actually for you. <laughs> so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to be disappointed. <laughs> yes. Then this is the movie for you. <laughs> <laughs> but like I just realized Amazing. I don't know if you're you're probably not but like there's the um you're probably not watching I mean but there's the uh the Lord of the Rings series that's on oh, right. now um the main actress is the same main actress uh oh. which I didn't even realize because she looks so different with blonde hair and and makeup in the uh mm -hmm. in the Lord of the Rings one so that was surprising Is it good? I have not been watching it. Um it's pretty good. It's um okay. It's good enough. It's you know, <laughs> I'm not a huge Lord of the Rings fan, but it feels like watchable and uh, interesting. And um, as always, Louis uh, guessed all of the twists. <laughs> 
so, that's so funny. <laughs> so that's fun to watch, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> maybe he should be a screenwriter. Yeah, maybe. He, like, could think of something that people wouldn't anticipate or something. Right? Like, yeah. He could actually surprise people. Yeah. Write a better twist. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's missed his calling. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I'll probably check that out eventually. Like, I, I read, like, The Hobbit. Mm-hmm. you know, as a like public high schooler or something. Mm-hmm. I don't think I read the other books, um, mm-hmm. but but The Hobbit, like I'm always told, is like the best of the books or like it's like a great like, yeah. read alone if you're not like fully invested in the series. I also only read The Hobbit, but yeah, I did watch I just the loved. It was yeah. so cute. The Hobbit yeah. movie was not good. No, but, no. <laughs> um, I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I used to like watch it around Thanksgiving mm-hmm. because we had like a few days like of downtime and mm-hmm. all of the food from it is like so oh, Thanksgiving, yeah. you know, like Hobbit kinds <laughs> of food. You're super so. into food. So that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I've always identified with those Hobbits right? in, in spite of my uh, large height and small feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you look like the opposite of a hobbit, but deep down you're a hobbit. <laughs> but I, I would make a great hobbit. <laughs> yeah. I just want to be an elf. Like every time I see all these beautiful elves with their like, I don't know, their outfits are so cool. Their hair is yeah. so nice. And like they live for thousands of years. I'm like, I would do oh, that. That sounds that exhausting. Nice. <laughs> I don't want to live that long. I, do. I don't want to have to be pretty, and I just want to eat <laughs> to to 11 teas and second <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That's fair. <laughs> um, so in the not on a like watching it scale, but uh, podcasts, I was listening to some of the uh, the other podcasters in the Darkcast Network, our podcast mm-hmm. network we're a part of. And I'm like, oh, like there's all these like cute indie podcasts. And I've been kind of yeah. bad about just listening to like Dateline and really mainstream <laughs> ones that don't really need my support. Like they're so good right. that I would rather, you know, give a listen, a follow, a download, whatever to somebody that's just getting started or could use yeah. the boost or, you know, whatever. So, right. um, so they're, they're so great. There's a lot of good ones, but one that like stood out that's especially Halloween-y that's maybe like a little different. It's like for people that are kind of like at their capacity for true crime and would like mm-hmm. something different is Cause of Death. Oh, and I love it. I love have it. Have you heard it? Yes. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, Jackie who is, is she an epidemiologist? Do you know? Yes. Like yeah, I know she she's is. a scientist. Yeah, yeah, she is. So that's what I was assuming she was. Like we're, we're Facebook friends and I'm just, I, I can't believe I'd never listened to it before. So good. But, um, you know, for people with anxiety, I think one thing that a lot of people with anxiety like to do is like sit and think about what can go wrong in general, but like wrong with your health, wrong in like kind of like crazy situations. Society, and, yeah. Yeah. And um, she covers things like, you know, like the measles and whatever. But for her Halloween episode for October, she did a zombie invasion. Ooh. <laughs> and like how it would spread, what would happen, like zombie oh, preparedness. That's awesome. What a good and idea. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. It's very cute. Like it was like very adorable. Like I just loved Aww. listening to it. I couldn't get enough. And um, I think like one of the most interesting things about it was like a lot of the information she had was from the CDC website. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, why is the CDC preparing for zombies? They're like, just in case. I mean. What don't we know? <laughs> not to say that we secretly have zombies in a lab that might escape, but, you know, <laughs> just in case. Right? <laughs> and so like I Googled it and I'm actually going to send her a message and I'll follow up, um, you know, with her response. But uh, I had like looked on the CDC website, basically looked up um like the wording she had used like zombie preparedness whatever cdc and it pulled up like an illustrated uh like comic book kind of style um like thing basically to help kids know how to get prepared for an emergency in general like it was like Aww. a halloween thing they had done <laughs> so it wasn't like meant to be serious it was mm. like basic things you can do like have clean drinking water yeah. like ready for a few days like ha- ha- keep your car with like half a tank of gas at all times have food that is non-perishable in case the electricity's out and like things like that 
Um, it's like they just use a zombie invasion as kind of like a backdrop, like to be cute. But mm-hmm. the way she was describing it, like I'm wondering if she found something else and I just didn't do enough digging, like if the CDC really did release this or if she was like wow. referencing this document. I don't know, but I'm, I'll find out and let you all know. Yeah, um, but it's cool. a great episode. Go listen to that. There's so many other dark cast podcasts out there um, that are great. So if you are caught up on Murder, Murder News, definitely go and uh, give some of those a listen to. Yeah, for sure. So um, as we anticipated in last week's episode, um, we mentioned that, uh, you know, we are not doctors or anything, but maybe our number one fanny had some input about um, SSRIs and their impact on, um, you know, suicidal ideation and violent tendencies. So she did write to us immediately about that, which we are so thankful for. So we're going to read her response. Um, She said... Hey, ladies, regarding today's episode, SSRI are not my specialty, but a quick review suggests that the link between fluoxetine and violence is unclear. Some studies say that fluoxetine may induce violent tendencies, while others conclude that violent tendencies or suicidal ideation were already there. In university, we were taught about the link so that we kept an eye on patients on SSRIs, but it was not explained why there's a link since scientists don't really understand it. So it's possible that the drugs just exacerbate something that's already there. Right. And we had talked about, um, we didn't mention in the episode, but in our conversation that there, you know, it might be like how people like to talk about their trilogy for serial killers. Like somebody Mm. might already, uh, like just being a psychopath does not mean that you're going to be a killer. In fact, there's like tons of people diagnosed with psychopathy that exist in society and they're not committing crimes and are regular Mm -hmm. functioning people. And like, it's, it's not, doesn't have to be a bad thing. No. And, um, but then you add in like other things, like you might add in a head injury or abuse Being as abused, a child. Yeah. And yeah. And then like, you're kind of like pushing them in a path of becoming like making the realization of becoming a killer. Yeah. So it could be like that with SRIs and we were just speculating. Yeah. Um, and Fanny thought that was maybe a plausible theory. Um, but, but there's no evidence of that, but (laughs) yeah, but that's what she, as uh, our smartest friend, um, that's how she kind of looks at it, that it seems like it's just a one thing that pushes you over the edge. So that's an interesting outlook for sure. Uh, we weren't sure about that one. So it's good to hear any input at all on that. Right. And we do know with the case that we covered with Alyssa Bustamante, that she, uh, already had, at least like suicidal tendencies before she was put on Prozac. Mm -hmm. Um, She was in the hospital when she was placed on it for uh, attempting suicide. And then she had written in her journal rather violent thoughts about burning down a house with a family inside of it. But I wasn't sure um, what the timeline for that entry was. I'm not sure Mm -hmm. if she had written that before she was put on Prozac. Um, or if that could have been an indicator. But um, mm-hmm. like we mentioned, the her defense team had tried to use that as a defense um, in her trial. And basically the judge mm-hmm. didn't buy it. And they said there wasn't enough evidence to say that that could yeah. have pushed her towards violent tendencies. So it's still a bit unclear. Yeah, it's interesting. It makes me think about how um, people um, suggest like marijuana can cause like um, just like real serious mental health issues, but then others are like, no, no, it's just like, if you're predisposed to that, then it can bring it out kind of thing. Like, I feel like that's present in a lot of um, situations and like you, you need this whole sort of recipe of things to uh, set up the perfect situation for like a violent criminal or someone being suicidal or whatever. Absolutely. Well, I guess that's enough murder for one week. But maybe this week, you're feeling like you need just a little bit more murder. If so, you know you can always find us on the OG murdermurder.news for the latest breaking true crime news all week long. You can find us on Instagram at Murder Murder News, on TikTok at Murder Murder News, on Twitter at mm, Murder News. Mm. On Facebook, you can find our page by searching for Murder Murder News. And if you search Murder Murder News on Facebook, our group should also pop up. You'll want to join us to stay in the loop about any upcoming live or virtual events and to find the Zoom link for our next book club meeting this Sunday. 
We've been reading The Daughter of Dr. Moreau by Silvia Moreno-Garcia, and in honor of Halloween, we highly recommend that everyone who comes out for this one shows up in costume. Also, keep an eye on our group because we will soon announce our next few book club selections for November, December, and January. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Reviews are so important if we want to keep this podcast alive and to keep creating creepy content catered to your interests. Have a great week. Happy Halloween. Bye, spooky friends. Yeah, happy Halloween. Bye. Murder, murder, murder.